This week on the Back Table Podcast. Over the years, our clinic infrastructure has definitely evolved and gotten more robust. I have more opportunities now than before, even to really develop those relationships. It's something that I've been known for in terms of the interactions I have with patients and just really trying to build that rapport because I really do value the trust that our patients put in. So I think I've always been like that, but make no mistake about it. When you're on the table and you have an adventure like this, it certainly opens your eyes. I do try to reflect on it pretty regularly because I don't want it to just be the past, right? I want to sort of learn from it and carry it with me and try to remind myself we're human beings taking care of human beings and we want to do the best we can for our patients. We want them to trust us. We want them to sort of let us do what we think is appropriate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. This episode is supported by Reflow Medical, makers of high-performance medical devices for peripheral and coronary interventions. Reflow credits much of the company's rapid growth to their physician partners who spurred the development of successful products like the Wingman Crossing Catheter, the Specs, and the Specs LP Shapeable Support Catheters, and the Cora Catheter Suite. Solutions that are physician imagined and reflow engineered. For more information, visit reflowmedical.com. And now back to the show. This is Brian Hartley as your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Nashville and co-founder of an early stage medical device company in the imaging space. I'm super excited to introduce our special guest this week, Dr. Jason Hoffman. Jason is an IR and educator with the NYU Langone Hospital System. He's also a self-proclaimed questionably fantastic musician, which I read on your Twitter, which I really want to hear about. So Dr. Hoffman's going to share his harrowing experience as a patient with us and how that has impacted his life and career. With that, let's dive right in. Jason, thank you so much for joining. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I, actually, I thought we were going to spend all the time talking about my first band as a resident named called Terminal, Ill- <laughs> Terminal Ilium, but I guess we don't have time for that today. Terminal maybe, maybe Ilium? Maybe a story for another day. Okay. No, now we definitely have to hear a little bit about that. <laughs> so let's start. Tell us a little bit about yourself, background, kind of education, obviously a, a music fanatic. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for, for having me on the, on the podcast. It's great to be here. I am from Long Island, born and raised in most of my training in New York, although I moved out to Philadelphia and was at UPenn for my IR fellowship and started as an early career IR there. And Life circumstances uh, brought me back to to New York more for family reasons. And for the past 13 years or so, I've been back on Long Island, worked at a hospital called Winthrop University Hospital, which over the years merged into the NYU system. So I've been at the same hospital now for about 13 years, although the name has changed a couple of times and we merged into NYU Langone Health about six, seven years ago at this point. I have a pretty robust IR practice. When I first joined at that institution, I did a mix of DR and IR. It was about 80% 80% IR, 20% DR when I started. And just over time, as my IR practice got busier, converted to 100% IR. In terms of IR sort of passions or what I really love to do, I mean, I love all the educational aspects of things in IR, whether it's with my trainees or whether it's trying to educate and work with my patients and our staff. I do a lot of prostate artery embolization, tumor ablations, you know, IO, uh, radio embolizations, chemo embo, helped build up a pretty robust fibroid practice over the years. And just have a great group of people that I work with. And in a way, I've been back serving my community. I live and grew up, I should say, about 10 miles from the hospital that I work in now. So it's been pretty nice over the years to help to take care of friends and family, or at least get them connected to people that I know will do their best for them. And it's been a fun ride so far, hopefully many, many years to go. I'm still, I would consider myself mid-career. So hopefully I'll be doing this for a long time. Awesome. So how did you get into IR? Yeah, it's, it, that in and of itself is a sort of a funny story. If you had asked me when I was 12 or 13 years old, I would have told you I wanted to be an interventional radiologist. And if what? Yeah. And if you really pushed me to say why, I'd say because somebody told me so. And that somebody is by the name of Dr. Nakamura. He's a cardiologist, actually retired now in Long Island, but a very close family friend. And I just, I don't know. I just, just always had a tremendous amount of respect for him and looked up to him. And I carried that with me. And he always thought that interventional radiology in his sort of career was this really exciting, growing field, innovative field. I think he had the vision to see that this would be a a really awesome sort of patient-facing field doing a lot of great things. So I carried that with me over the years. And 
when I got to medical school, I, I made sure that I sought out some IR experiences. And as you know, that's not always so easy to do. But for me, it really worked out. And pretty wild decades later, that's what I do. That is crazy. Most a lot of med students don't know what an IR is. Bro. That is true. And here I was in middle school. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it's it's pretty wild. I tell that story often to students that uh, I do. A, we have a, a medical school actually on our on our campus on Long Island. It's a small medical school that's a accelerated three year primary care focused medical school. But I oversee all the radiology education there, and I I run a leadership um, sort of training program for our students as well. So when I talk about career paths and career development, I I like to talk about myself, not because I'm more important than anybody, but I do like to try to poke fun at myself and keep them engaged and they and tell them my own stories. So, so yeah, they, I told them that story a few weeks ago, actually. Yeah, that's now yeah, that's very interesting and very rare. So, what's your favorite case? What, what kind of cases do you like to do? Yeah, so over the last few years, I really, really gotten real busy in my prostate practice. So, I spend a lot of time with my BPH practice and. I think that for me, it's been particularly rewarding because maybe eight years before that or 10 years before that, I really worked pretty hard with my urology colleagues to build up a, an ablation practice and do a lot more sort of GU work and, and renal cell carcinoma ablation. And, and while the urology colleagues that I've sort of partnered with or really developed great relationships with over the years, it, they might not have been the exact same urologist that I did the ablations with or do ablations sort of with in terms of working through patients and talking about options. Their partners are the ones who often now are referring me BPH patients. And I think a lot of that has to do with the care that we've provided, the relationships we built with with the referrers and also with our patients. And it's been that's been really rewarding. I've had more letters written to sort of department or hospital leadership for patients who have had, you know, phenomenal outcomes as we often expect to see with PAE compared to patients who we've had other sort of life-saving treatments. And, and as you know, there's so many patients out there that we can help with with the procedures we can offer. And PAE is just just one of a litany of, of awesome procedures that we do. But I spent a lot of time over the last, I don't know, five to seven years, I guess, really working on that. And, and that I think is, is around where I work is probably what I'm known for the most these days. Okay. And do you do any DR? Occasionally, I'll do some DR, pick up a shift to to read some read some films or something for sort of extra work, so to speak, or moonlighting. But but not in my real IR practice at this point. Are you afraid at all of losing those skills, or just curious? Yeah, you know, it's something that I think about. We see colleagues, and look, we see patients who are dealt all sorts of difficult hands in life, who are used to doing something, and then tragedy strikes or something happens and they can't quite do the work that they do. And I think about it, you know, wearing lead all the time and radiation exposure and back injuries and just so many different things. You're not immune from back injuries doing DR. Now that I do a lot, mainly DR, all DR, I'm, I'm like, my back hurts worse sitting in a chair all day, to be honest. I don't know if there's a better way. It's funny you mentioned that. I actually was talking to somebody about that recently because years ago, I wrote a paper, I think it was an AJR, and, and it had to do with the sedentary behavior of sort of a risks of sedentary behaviors of various professions. And, you know, DR is sort of towards the top of that list. So DR is towards the top of that list. And so again, it, there's no perfect profession, I guess, from a back injury standpoint, but it's, it's something that I think about. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm one of these IRs that, I mean, I, I use my diagnostic radiology routes every day, right? Whether it's in clinic or thinking about procedures that I'm doing, you know, long-term management. So while I'm not in the trenches of a, the DR world, like sitting down and reading, reading cases for eight or 10 hours a day, I certainly value all of that. And we'll see over time what, where things go. I also know that as I've gotten busier in my career and I have other administrative responsibilities, I don't want to just do like a little bit of a few things, if that makes sense, right? So, so trying to balance it. We all have some different career paths, but for me, it I do a mix of, you know, my IR work, my clinical practice. I do a lot of teaching, sort of program development for educational stuff at my institution, and we'll see where life takes me. You never know. Cool. No, I think that's a that's a good answer. Okay, so let's get to the meat of this. Uh, you had a pretty important case on one of your call nights. Maybe you can share that story with us. Sure, absolutely. It happened a few years ago, and I know I remember the date pretty well. Actually, it was a Friday night, December fifteenth, twenty seventeen. So. A number of years ago, just before the holidays, right? I happened to celebrate Christmas and my, my wife's birthday is typically right around Thanksgiving. So it's right in the, the middle of all these things happening. And I was working that Friday and, and actually I was, 
I think if I remember correctly, I was interviewing for the radiology residency program and I started to take call on, on Friday and in the middle of the night, Friday night, got involved in a, in a case, sort of a young to middle-aged patient. I happened to be a male who had pretty severe abdominal pain, came to the ER, described it as pretty acute, um, excruciating pain, 10 out of 10, and ends up getting worked up in the ER and, and gets a, a CT and is diagnosed with pretty massive portal vein thrombosis. And wow. so the pain was, you know, acute mesenteric ischemia from- That's not very common. Yeah, not, you know, not, not super common. It's one of those things that I've been involved in treating certainly not dozens of times, right? I've been involved in some cases over the years. I guess just to sort of set the landscape, my hospital is a 600-bed hospital. Let's say you know, we have level one trauma center, pretty busy oncology practice. We do all sorts of different things, but we're right. This is not the type of patient that walks into the ER for us five times a week or something. So, so um, yeah, so I was on call and the consult comes through. Now, at this point, it was a Friday night going into Saturday morning. So about 2 a.m., there's this emergent IR consult. And I guess if I had to give a sentence summary, it's a, at the time, it was a 39-year-old, I think, patient. And again, severe abdominal pain, found to have acute mesenteric ischemia, massive portal vein thrombosis. And conversation happens about getting started on systemic anticoagulation and heparin IV infusion. And again, here, I, IR is involved. And I ran into a little bit of a snag then because I was on call, but I needed some help because the story here is, unfortunately, the patient was me. So I was on call for this and started to have abdominal pain about a day or day and a half earlier and thought I could sort of fight through it. And I went to work and was doing my work and went home that Friday night. And my wife looked at me and she's like, you look like you're dying. Well, why are you home? You were just at the hospital. And we had a four-year-old or we have a, a son still. He's, he's not four anymore. But in my mind, I wanted to come home and see him and sort of try to put him to bed. It was actually, this is all 100% true, I promise you. Um, it was the night of our holiday party as well. And I'm, I'm one of these people who, even though I was on call, it's, it's really, I think it's really important to get out there and enjoy time with the staff and, and just, just everybody together and celebrate the community that we have. And, you know, I didn't show up for the party that night. So I think everybody knew that something was up. One of my partners knew I wasn't feeling great. None of us ever would have suspected this was what was going on. So here I am almost writhing on the floor in pain. And I'm at home right now, actually, while we're doing this recording. And uh, I'm in an office that's 10 feet around the hall from where I was, right, and sort of smiling and reliving it a little bit here. It's a miracle I'm alive, I guess. But but anyway, my wife fortunately convinced me that I was at the wrong place. I needed to get back to the hospital. So I drove myself back to the hospital, which is probably also not a great idea, but I live real close. And I got to the ER and it was at that point, very early Saturday morning and, and saw a colleague that I knew right in the ER and explained what was going on and got worked up pretty quickly and got that scan. And we mentioned earlier that I, obviously, as an interventional radiologist, I have my, my board certification in DR and IR, and, and uh, I was laying on that CAT scan table, got off the table, and the CT tech, who I knew well, said, hey, do you want to look at your images? And I said, sure, I'll take a look. And I had never received any narcotic pain medicine before in my life, so I definitely had a pretty decent dose of morphine in me at that point, because the, the pain was pretty, I wouldn't have wished that on anybody, pain was intense. And I, I looked at the scan, I remember scrolling up and down. And it's something just strikes you, right? That something's missing, yeah. meaning I don't see yeah, the portal the missing, meaning, right? What's yeah, you know something <laughs> is wrong. Yeah, uh, and at that time, you know, we did even then, we had 24-7 in-house attendings and, and sometimes our attendings are remote now. So much has changed over the last few years. But the attending the radiologist that was on and the resident, I remember I called them and they thought I was pranking them because we, we years ago, we were known for maybe a, a mild prank or two on the night of the holiday party and, and that sort of stuff. So it's not, no, guys, I'm... My name's on the work list. Please take a look. And they come running into the CT scan area. Couldn't believe what they were seeing either. Anyway, then I was right, unfortunately, when I did the wet read on my own scan that it was the entire portal venous system was out, splenic vein was out, SMV, everything was out. A little bit of some mild bowel, uh, small bowel thickening and like the left upper quadrant near the jejunum. But my vitals were, were good and my lactate was like slightly up, but I was pretty benign exam, shall we say. I didn't have like a surgical abdomen per se per exam, but I was I was definitely hurting. So I got, yeah, I got whisked back down to the ER and, and here I was on call, right? And and reached out to my partners and, hey guys, you know, great news, cool case, right? Bad news, bad news. I hope somebody can come and help me. And they did, of course. They uh, actually, both of these guys, unfortunately for me, have sort of moved on in, in their careers in other places now, but uh, one still works on Long Island. His name's Nick Giorgio. Thanks, Nick, if you hear this one day. He knows a lot today. And Manny Hans, another colleague, and, and the two of them together, friend, that really for days just sort of 
dropped what they were doing to do a lot of procedures on me to to get me through. Um, I know we, of course, we we would do that for patients, any patient, right? That's what our job is. But I was the one on call, but and it went started on a Saturday morning and went for days. I was in and out procedures in the IR suite and did they did transhepatic access and did thrombolysis and did a lot of angioplasty and I think we were sort of on the verge of whether or not I would need a tip t- tips and have flow restored that way. And and fortunately for me, they were real persistent and I think we pushed the line of how aggressive to be, but probably use more TPA and for many more hours than maybe conventional uh, wisdom would have told us. But anyway, that that's what I, I say. I say we did. I mean, I, I didn't really do it, right? I was sort of laying there. You weren't holding guide wire and yeah, I think you didn't get access. Uh, they they, they uh. took care of all the hard work. I had to, to sort of lay there, although I guess in my own way. Do you remember much of it? I remember parts. Yeah. I mean, there were parts that it was pretty extreme, the pain. So we did have anesthesia there and there are parts that I was more deeply sedated than others. How many times were you on the table? So, yeah, so I, I joke that I, I've now I've seen, you know, every table in my department for various reasons in terms of the work up and follow up, because there was a whole other question as to why it happened, right? Sort of, that's all another story. But I was in and out of the IR suite probably four times, so four different days and multiple days of lysis and interventions thrown back to me, you know, angioplasty and, and, and so that they chipped away at it. And clinically, I was, I was sort of holding on. So we, we went that path and Ironically, what what hurt the most at the end, I was, I'll never forget. I was in the sick queue, and and after they were done, and I ended up actually, I had a, you know, I had an A line, and I have transhepatic access, and I ended up, ironically, here I am, the PAE guy, I end up in urinary retention requiring a Foley. So I have a newfound appreciation from seven years ago about unexpected urinary retention, but I think it just went along with being immobilized and a lot of sedation and meds and bodies out of whack, shall we say, right, for a period of time. So when they were done with the procedures at the end, did some track embolization on the way out. I think that there was probably some diaphragmatic irritation there. That that was pretty intense. The pain there at the end was almost like back at the beginning, but a different type of pain. I'm super lucky. I mean, I didn't need other sorts of surgical interventions or going down the tips bath and other other things. Now I realize in 2024 we might handle this a little differently compared to 2017, right? We we have other tools, other techniques. Sort of we know more. We may approach this a bit different, but I'm pretty lucky. My splenic vein, my main portal's open left. Portal's been open now for years and have some chronically occluded right portal branches, but I've had some left-sided hypertrophy and, and my intestines are working just fine. So I'm, again, unlucky that it happened, but but super lucky that a great team of people took awesome care of me and not just the IR team, so many other specialties you know, as well. And still now, right? Managing long-term. Wow. Now tell me, did they ever find out an etiology or is there some type of hypercoagulable state? Yeah, I'm full of stories that don't really make sense, or, or you might laugh a little bit. So so I'm in the ER, and they start a heparin drip, and I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, my dad was diagnosed you know, 30 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago, with a uh, with DVT and ended up with factor five. And, and I actually have it, and I knew about it since I was in medical school. But at the time, the thought was it was heterozygous, that just to not, not to sort of do anything. That being said, most patients that I've seen, this was a pretty unique way to present. And the thought was maybe there's more to it than just being having a hypercoagulable state because the portal system is a pretty big vasculature, right? Rel- somewhat r- relatively decent flow. And you think about DVT, things like that. Now, that being said, every patient's different. And the thought was probably that I had some biliary dyskinesia and, and not a cholecystitis per se, but that maybe I had a little bit of inflammation or something that might have triggered this. I had a, all sorts of work up, right, to make sure I didn't have any malignancy and things like that, which fortunately, you know, I don't. But yeah, so I still follow, you know, with, with my hematologist and, and get, you know, imaging and GI and, and my IR team is aware of what's happening. But luckily, since literally December of 2017, I have not needed any other IR procedures uh, relating to this, which is which is great. Any anticoagulation? Did you mention that? No. Yeah. So I didn't mention, but right. Yeah. So I am on Xarelto. I'm I joked, uh, I have a picture uh, that I've shown at times when I've spoken about this of me and the package insert of Xarelto, right? And it makes me think all the time I talk to patients about meds, whatever it may be, whether it's in the BPH space or IO space, wherever. And I opened up the package insert from Xarelto and it's, you know, I don't know, four point font, some tiny font, right? It's the equivalent of probably a hundred pages of, of information. And I thought, wow, if I read this, I'm certainly never going to want to take it. And I can imagine, I thought, oh, imagine if I didn't have any medical knowledge and I start reading this, it's pretty scary. But it's important for me to be on, and and uh, I'm on the half dose now. So we did full dose for for a while, and I'm on the ten to ten milligram dose now, and been doing great for years, which is I'm really lucky. Tell me, during the experience, how did you feel? I've had ultrasounds and things done, and there's almost like a 
it's not a helplessness, but you just feel like this is not where I'm supposed to be. How did you feel kind of emotionally going through that? Kind of vulnerable, I assume. Yeah. I mean, I was at the hospital for about seven nights and most of that was ICU level care. And and again, I, I came to the ER. I mean, I knew something was wrong, right? By that point, I knew I had a problem, but I, I just never would have thought I had what I had, if that makes sense. And over that experience, uh, it was a shock, right? To be diagnosed with what I had. And all these little micro experiences have happened, particularly over that week. And even since then of bringing myself to the ER, sort of not being able to say goodbye to my son, right? This happens to our patients all the time, right? When, when crazy things happen. I didn't have any idea what grave danger I sort of was in or could have been in. Maybe I should have, right? Maybe I just was neglecting the fact that I knew I was in a lot of pain. Calling my partners, I'll never forget, you know, the, again, everybody showed up, extra nurses, texts. One of my nurses was pregnant at the time and we had been joking about, you know, just about the timing of her delivery. And, and, and I remember she, she was there for one of my procedures and just, and then again, these are people I work with for years, right? These are your friends, these are your extended family. And just, it was just overwhelming in terms of the emotion. That being said, I wanted to see my son. So, you know, my, they figured out a way before I went into one of the procedures that my wife brought my son and, and people brought little things that I could give to him and try to cover up any of the lines that I had. And it was hard to hold myself together for that, truthfully. Watching my parents watch me do that, you know, you, you know no parent ever wants to see their child suffer, or expects to see their child suffer. And my parents sort of watched that, my wife too, right? Of course, seeing me try to do that for my son, but not let him realize how sick I was, but just I needed to see him before one of these procedures certain day. And again, I mean, I was surrounded with people. I mean, my, my residents, colleagues, I mean, I've worked at the hospital for, for years by that point. And, and there was an outpouring of support, but there were also times where you just need to be alone because you don't want people to see you suffering or see you in pain either. And, and you know, sometimes you're just not in the mood to put, put the big smile on your face. But what happened in IR, I mean, it was incredible, right? I, I was out of the hospital after a week and I felt like I could go back to work a couple of days later. And again, my partners were like, you're nuts. You have to take a week. And I think it was either the first or second case back was a, was a PAE I was doing. And I remember being halfway through it thinking, all right, I'm physically not 100%. Like mentally, I was fine. I said, I just have to just sort of think this through. But I had a speaking engagement at an event in, in Vegas, ironically, just like a couple of weeks later. And in my mind and in my body, I said, you know what? I, I need to get there. Like I, I want to show myself that that I'm back, so to speak, or that I that I survived, at least in the short term. And yeah, so I was, I think early January, mid-January of 2018, I was out speaking at the event I was supposed to be teaching at. And for me, it was really meaningful. So everything happened so fast, you know, um, and again, the, the care, I was lucky. I mean, my, the care I had was, was awesome. But I've thought a lot about over the years about going back to work fast. And a lot of what we offer patients in IR is relatively fast healing, right? That That's one of the or at least physical healing. That's one of the the things that's great about what we can do for our patients. Do amazing procedures, offer excellent outcomes, and often, you know, again, of course, minimally invasive, low risk, but not no risk, right? And then sometimes the healing though is more than just physical. So I went back to work a week later. I think in the grand scheme of things, I'm glad I did it, but it didn't mean that I was like a hundred percent mentally prepared for what was going to happen when I was back at work. So that's opened my eyes a lot, you know, to that as well. How did it change the way you practice medicine and work with your patients? Yeah. Over the years, our clinic infrastructure has definitely evolved and gotten more robust. So I think I have more opportunities now than before even to, to really develop those relationships. It's something that I've been, I think, typically known for in terms of the interactions I have with patients and just really trying to build that rapport because I really do value the trust that our patients put in. So I think I've always been like that, but make no mistake about it. I mean, when you're on the table and you have an adventure like this, it certainly opens your eyes. And, and uh, I do try to reflect on it pretty regularly because I don't want it to just be the past, right? I want to sort of learn from it and carry it with me and try to just sort of remind myself we're human beings taking care of human beings, right? And we want to do the best we can for our patients. We want them to trust us. We want them to sort of let us do what we think is appropriate. But you know, a lot of what we do is educating our patients and understanding sort of where they are in their care, what, why they're interested maybe in some of the procedures we have to offer, or if they're not interested, why, and not judging them, right? But just helping them make decisions that they're comfortable with, that we also hopefully agree with are appropriate for them. So it's opened my eyes about, again, I think that relationship as well. And, and over the past few years, I've done more sort of reflection and talking also about 
what it really means in terms of the phrase, the patient experience, because sometimes I feel like that gets overutilized. But again, I think that our presence at a lot of hospitals and IR on the floor, much more present maybe than we would have been 15, 20 years ago, certainly more robust clinics across the country. And, and I'm sure we could, many of us could still do better than we do, but, but being present, not just for those procedures is certainly important. And then, and again, a lot of the procedures we do, patients are awake. Right. So it's a different environment. We know this already. I realize, you know, we've, we've all gone to medical school. We're talking as, as radiologists and interventional radiologists. People know this already, but I don't know. I think it's, it's easy to, to, to forget that at times that, yes, we're taking care of patients or they're feeling vulnerable. We understand that. But the fact that they're awake or awake ish, if we can use that term in a way, that's a great thing that they don't have to have general anesthesia and be intubated for everything that we're doing. But it does add a different dynamic, right? For some patients that, that they can sort of hear and see. And that could be a great thing, but for some patients, it can be really difficult for them to sort of to handle. Yeah, it sounds like you really just need to be aware of these things. And certainly an experience like yours will make you acutely aware of all of these things. But it's a, a great reminder for everyone else as well that there's a patient that has emotions underneath there and, and you need to put yourself in their shoes to, to treat them in the best way. Yeah. It, another ironic thing, or not ironic, I guess, and unfortunately was a relatively devastating thing that happened to me a few years later in life during the COVID pandemic is my dad got sick and he ironically years later ended up with some degree of portal vein thrombosis, not the extreme that I had, but it was relating to unfortunately have, he was diagnosed with pretty aggressive, large uh, HCC, probably diagnosed a little late you know, relating to COVID and delays and just him seeing docs. But he unfortunately you know, passed away from his disease, but the same docs and including myself, I mean, and so many other docs in my institution helped take care of him. And so then being his family member, right, being his son, watching him come into our IR, same rooms, right? He's on the same table as I was, or tables. And, but that concept of waiting for a procedure and a delay that may happen because we're helping another patient, right? But sometimes our patients don't quite get that. And, and I know we don't have endless amount of time to go and apologize to every patient when there's a delay. But it, it can be hard to make every patient feel that there's the center of attention all the time. And that's what they want. And in a way, that's what we all deserve as human beings. But but we, we're stretched thin, right? We're doing a lot of work and we're trying to take care of a lot of patients and teach and do all sorts of different things. And sometimes patients you know, feel judged. I know I remember sometimes people met my dad and, and saw they had heard that HCC. I could tell a few of them right away were like, oh, he must have must have been a drinker, must have been this. And and obviously it doesn't really matter, first of all. Second of all, he wasn't, <laughs> but he had, there's some other things that were going on uh, genetically we've come to learn. But it's so easy. We have different biases in life, right? And and we don't want to judge people, but we, we only know what we know. We know what we've experienced. And, and sort of watching a few people's faces over a few visits my dad had into IR, where I could tell and they heard HCC and they just make certain assumptions and try it. I, I've always tried not to do that. I don't think I do. I'm sure I've, I'm not perfect, right? So we all, we all fail at times. There's always times in life we could do things better. But that was a whole nother complexity to my my path over the last few years of of having my eyes open with that as well. And it, it, it is a bit ironic. And I'm lucky because I had portal vein thrombosis and survived. My dad's was a whole nother different reason, but he didn't survive, right? And a lot of patients don't survive due to all sorts of different things that happen and bad hands they're dealt, so to speak. It's hard. It's hard on patients. It's, it's, it can be hard on the docs. But that being said, I think, again, in IR, one of the things I love is that I work with a lot of different types of patients, a lot of different types of providers. And we're not 100% successful, but, but make no mistake about it. I mean, every day in an IR practice, you have the opportunity and, and the honor, right, in many ways to, to help patients and their families. And I think overall, IR does a great job at that. And um, you know, it's something we, we have to try to hold it in our hearts and keep us motivated and and excited and committed to what we're doing. That is a fantastic place to stop. I want to thank you so much, Jason, for sharing your story and and especially, you know, the one about your dad too. It's clearly affected how you how you practice and I'm sorry you had to go through those things, but hopefully everybody else can learn as well and maybe take a little little piece of that and incorporate it into their practice and and how they treat patients. Well, thanks so much again for having me, and I'm very happy that we did not derail the conversation about terminal ileum. We can deal with that. Another, we can deal with that another day. But thanks so you much know, for I having forgot. me. I appreciate it. No, no, all good. I shouldn't have brought it up again, but I had to at the end. All good. All good. Well, with that, thank you so much, Jason Hoffman. It's fantastic chatting with you, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. 
If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Lambir Singh Sundu. Administrative support provided by Jim Willie Kennebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 